We are used to seeing birds, squirrels, and maybe an occasional deer in our suburban neighborhoods. But what about other animals that are exploring our yards when we are asleep? I am Marcia Civic, and this is Bee Provided Conservation Radio. You may be surprised to learn that animals like bobcats, coyotes, and even mountain lions may be exploring our yards at night. It doesn't matter if you live in the country, city, or suburb to have these beautiful animals as neighbors. In many places, there are bobcats too, but nobody ever sees them. They they tend to, and, and they're, they're hard to study because of their temperaments and, and how sort of skittish and evasive and elusive they can be. But... That was the voice of Sarah Killingsworth, my guest today. Sarah is a mother, attorney, wildlife educator, and wildlife photographer. Like many of us passionate about saving wild animals, we find that we have to wear several hats to make a living and to do what we love. Sarah is definitely passionate about bobcats, and that is the topic of our show today. And she has spent thousands of hours in the field photographing and studying them. And I was really excited to learn more about these beautiful cats from her. And I've never talked about them yet on my show in any detail. And I'm really even more motivated to learn about them because like many of us during the start of the pandemic, I started watching more nature in my own yard and discovered that I have a bobcat or even a bobcat family setting up territory on my property. It's so exciting. So I asked Sarah to be on the show after hearing about her work through Project Coyote and after reading her recent article in Bay Nature Magazine, spring edition titled Country Cat, City Cat, which is a beautiful photo essay of suburban bobcats in Northern California. Before we get started, I wanted to announce that this is my 99th episode. This is a huge milestone for me since I am typically shy and don't like the sound of my own voice. <laughs> so it's been really tough. I am also learning all the studio stuff and audio engineering stuff, and it's, but it's all been a wonderful journey. And I just love speaking to all of my conservation heroes and meeting new ones. And so I hope you have enjoyed listening to these shows as well. My 100th ep- episode is being celebrated in my hometown of Traverse City, Michigan, where I interview Caitlin Bennett of North Sky Raptors. She has a special in-person treat for myself and my family, and I am very excited. It is, it is certainly nice to finally celebrate at home with family and friends after these long months of having to stay away. So enjoy today's interview. I hope it makes you fall in love with bobcats and want to learn more about how to protect them and be good neighbors to them. Welcome to our show today. I am with Sarah Killingsworth and she is a conservation photographer and educator. And yeah, I'm just happy to be talking to her today about bobcats. And I haven't talked about bobcats yet on the show. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you for joining. Oh, thank you for having me, Marsha. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really excited. I've been following your work for a while with Project Coyote and a beautiful article, which I hope we can talk about, that was in Bay Nature magazine. So, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But in the in the formal introduction, I mentioned, you know, you, like many of us, including myself, have worked in completely different fields in the past. And in your case, you are a lawyer and you kind of transitioned into this conservation, photography and education field as well. And I'm really interested in learning what drew your photography and conservation interest to bobcats besides them being completely adorable and lovable. So, (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a really good starting point. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think my passion for photography and wildlife in particular led me to start bringing my kids out into wilderness areas to observe animals and really to sort of just give them an experience a little away from modern life and screens. And 
I happen to live in Northern California where we're lucky to have a, a fair number of bobcats. And I've always been fascinated by cats, both the domestic and wild. So it was sort of a natural sort of magnetic attraction once I started going out and sitting and watching bobcats. They are really not just beautiful. Their coats are beautiful with the spots. And one of the things I love is that they're very individual. So every bobcat really does have a different appearance. And so I can tell them apart now after years of observing different cats based on how big the spots are, how dark mm. the spots are versus faded, the marks on their faces. But I think it's also their personalities. Bobcats are just so incredibly patient and tenacious. And, and then when they pounce so strong, uh, it's really, it's amazing to watch. And then in addition to those traits, watching a mother bobcat raise her kittens, there is a devotion and a tenderness that is really wonderful to see too. Not that other wild parents don't have that as well, but watching a mom with her kittens is pretty special. <laughs> I can imagine. And is it usually the mother that just raises the young or is there a team eff effort with parents? No, okay. bobcats are, it's pretty much all on mom. The oh. males are around for a brief interlude and then uh, continue on their way, usually creating several families during that season. And so it's the mothers alone. And, and bobcats are generally not only territorial, but solitary. So they are really only together when they are being raised by their mother and then they will disperse and each will find an individual territory. Oh, interesting. I know I'm going to get sidetracked on questions, but uh, <laughs> it's going to lead us down a rabbit hole. But how old are they usually when they leave their mother and, and venture so off it, on their it own? Varies. Yeah. yeah, it varies a little bit based on location, habitat, but generally nine to 12 months old. Oh, wow. That's okay. Pretty young. That seems yeah. like, yeah. I mean, compared to some of the other cats that I've learned about. So when you're out photographing bobcats, you know, you get a peek into their their world that many of us don't. We don't see. We can't, you know, we're not patient enough to sit and, and watch and wait or have the long lens. But um, can you share any unique behaviors of bobcats that you were surprised maybe to learn about? Something that you're like, oh, I didn't know they did that. Yeah, so I think the things, I'm always amazed at the similarities to and the differences from domestic cats. So bobcats, like a domestic cat, will wash their face with their front paw. So they'll lick their front paw and wash their face, which Aww. is just super cute. <laughs> and for those who have cats at home, you know that right before they pounce, they have sort of tell tail body language, either the wiggle at the back end or the switching of the tail. And what's been fascinating is that bobcats also have body language when they're hunting and when they're fixated on something. So right before they pounce, they flatten their ears against their head. And when they're really concentrating on something or they're annoyed, they'll flick, you know, bobcats are named for their short or bobbed tail and their tail is usually four to seven inches. And when they're focused, they'll twitch, the tail will flick. So anyway, I, you know, those kind of behaviors are just fun to see. The thing that I watched bobcats do that maybe surprised me the most, and it's something that I've seen coyotes and other animals do, but bobcats seem somewhat more serious and less playful, is rolling on the ground on their back with all four legs in the air. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of animals do dust baths as a way to manage parasites and basically clean themselves. I hadn't really expected bobcats to do that, you know, because they lick themselves clean. And so it, it had, but watching one, I mean, literally like wiggling its spine on the back, you know, on the ground <laughs> oh. um, with its paws up in the air. It's, it's pretty fun. How fun. You are so lucky you get to see some of this stuff. Yeah, that's wonderful. I am. So, so speaking of, you know, how long does it take you to actually get a good photograph? This is kind of an aside. I mean, you're you're sitting out there with a long lens, I assume, and, and probably tall grass, you know, dealing with the bugs that they're dealing with and stuff. Yeah. How, yeah. how glamorous is that job? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a glamorous gig, Marshall. <laughs> I know, because everybody say they want it, you know, when they see the photographs. You no, know, I have a running joke. I mean, I'm usually lying in the field when I'm yeah. shooting, often lying down for a low vantage point. And so I routinely come home filthy, dirty, forget stick, you know, pieces of seeds and <laughs> stickers and dirt and sometimes yeah. even grosser things and wet sand. I mean, it doesn't, 
you know, whatever I'm shooting, I'm often quite dirty. But the question you ask is a really good one because for me, part of what's really important about wildlife photography is doing it in a way that's ethical and making sure that we're not doing harm to the animals we photograph while we're photographing them. And that really starts with empathy. And to have empathy and to get a good shot often means spending a long time, a long time understanding the animal's behavior before you even go out and shoot. So I know what the signs of distress look like in a bobcat. So I can tell when I'm stressing a cat and I know to back away or I can tell when it's looking uncomfortable. And so there's preparation and time before you even head out into the field with a camera. And yes, I do shoot with a long lens. And when I do classroom presentations, I actually bring the camera and the lens and I show the kids that it's like a telescope. It makes things look much closer than they really are because... I don't want them to see pictures of these native predators that look like they could have been sitting in my lap when I took the photo. Yeah, with their iPhone or something. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And I've seen, unfortunately, I've seen many people with their iPhones walking out and trying to get photos of bobcats and other animals. And you just, you can't do it with a wide angle lens at a safe or reasonable distance for that animal. So I have spent probably thousands of hours with bobcats and in that time you develop what i part of what i like about wildlife photography is the ability to be truly present and and it's sort of in a way a meditation and that slowing down and being truly present gives you a communion with both the wilderness or the wild area that you're in as well as whatever animals are there and that's how to really get a great photo you're probably looking for either an emotion that's being conveyed in the image and or interesting or unique behavior and obviously the combination of the two is ideal and and to anticipate those behaviors and and know what kind of shots would get an emotion you often have to spend a lot of time again observing the animal, knowing when it's going to enter the, spe- the section of the field that's got the best light at sunset. You know, there's a million things that go into. And sometimes you get lucky and you drive up or hike up to a spot and you get a good photo in an hour or two. But many times it's days, weeks, months, and in my case for bobcats, years of photographing them wow. to really get a good photo that you're really, you know, you look at it and you think, wow, like that was great. That's amazing. That's a lot of dedication. And yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. And this brings back or brings up some questions for me about bobcats themselves. Like you mentioned going into a certain light of day to to hunt and such. So do they hunt in a particular time of day that works best for them? Or are they nighttime, daytime hunters? Yeah, so bobcats are generally crepuscular, so early in the day and late in the day. However, their eyesight is adapted to have night vision. So they are often active at night, but not as much hunting because when you think about animals and when they hunt, it's it's based in part on when they'll be successful in getting their prey. And bobcats primarily prey on rodents, rabbits, sometimes birds, lizards, snakes. But, you know, like out here in Northern California, primarily it's gophers and voles mm-hmm. and cottontail rabbits and jackrabbits. So those are kind of the mainstays of the diet. And those are going to be things that are active during the day. And so actually, oftentimes, I will find bobcats hunting even earlier than the late afternoon, like even midday or early afternoon, especially if it's a mom feeding kittens, because she's, you know, bobcats, when they have a litter, can be as many as five, but usually it's two to four. Okay. She's bringing food to all of them until they learn to hunt. So even even when they're quite young and they're nursing, she's bringing kills back to them to start teaching them sort of what that's going to look like. And, mm-hmm. and eventually they will, she will bring a kill and they will run to her and fight over it. And somebody will grab it and run off to the bushes and eat it. But, you know, she's, she'll kill three times and not get any of them if she's got three kittens, right? She'll kill, bring it to one kitten, kill, bring it to another kitten until then she'll feed herself. And so... Wow. For an animal, it's sort of like owls during the day when they have owlets. They have so much food they need to bring back to the young that they end up hunting outside their normal hunting times because they just, they have to get enough prey. Yeah, busy, busy mom. So, so how, how, yeah, yeah. (laughs) that's amazing. So how, how big do, do bobcats actually get? They're our smallest cat, right? In North America. 
Are they the smallest cat we have here? So, or wild cat? Yeah. Okay. They are the most widespread wild cat in North America. Okay. And yes, they are. They are small. small. Um, in fact, most people think that they're bigger than they actually are. So if you think about an average house cat, maybe is 10 pounds. A female bobcat on average is going to be 14 pounds. Wow. So not that much bigger. The range is, you know, up to 18 for a female and for males is more like 18 to 25 pounds, probably on average more like 20 or 21 pounds. So they're longer and leaner than a house cat and their legs are taller. So they, you know, up to their shoulders could be, you know, a foot and a half Mm -hmm. tall to two feet tall. So they have a different proportion than house cats, but from a weight standpoint, they're not nearly as much bigger. So I've had many people tell me and you know it happens in the parks too people report seeing a quote mountain lion and it's actually a bobcat and mountain lions you know weigh 100 pounds or 135 if it's a you know i mean they're much much bigger cats but and and far actually i mean bobcats are relatively skittish but mountain lions avoid humans you know way more even than bobcats do and are truly nocturnal so yeah but bobcats are, are relatively small i think people think they're bigger than they are Interesting. Well, that brings up, you know, I saw this YouTube video of a pretty good sized bobcat and maybe it's enhanced or something. I'm not sure, but it was actually attacking a deer. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. So So. especially on the East Coast, fawns are a primary food source for bobcats. Okay. Okay. Uh, I thought they'd be too big. Yeah. Yeah, No, Bob, I mean, they're amazing hunters. Um, and they kill with a bite to the neck. So usually, either oh. usually the back of the neck or the fr- front of the neck. And so we'll either break the neck or, or suffocate an animal that way. And so they'll hold on to the neck tightly until the animal dies kind of thing. The other thing about how big a bobcat looks is how thick their coat is depends also on where they are. So again, I'm in California where it's relatively warm most of the year. Um, as you move east in the U.S. or north, the bobcats, their average weight gets a little heavier, and they also have much thicker coats because they have to deal with winter and, you know, snow and much colder temperatures. And so right. Right. they tend to be bigger, heavier, and sort of fluffier looking cats. That's not a technical term, but, you know, they're, <laughs> so they look thicker. Makes sense. And this was probably an East Coast cat, I think. I want to say it was somewhere on the East Coast. I was just surprised yeah. that it could take down a, a deer. So you mentioned their, their eyes and so is that what they do do they have really good eyesight and sense of smell to rely on on getting their prey so um bobcats primarily do use their vision and their hearing their sense of hearing for hunting smell is actually not really important for bobcats they do mark territory with scent so with scat or with urine they also will scratch so that's another similarity with house cats if you've got a cat scratcher and your cat scratches bobcats scratch too Oh, but cool. they scratch they scratch not just to sharpen their claws, but actually their scent glands and their scent marking when they scratch. So it's a way to mark their territory. So for cat for bobcats, scent and the sense of smell is much real is much more related to territory than it is to hunting. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, I was just curious. And what is their territory size when you know because you know, say you have four kittens, you, you know, there's a lot of territory is spreading out, you know, if all of them survive. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. So um, putting the question of whether they all survive, I know. Aside <laughs> uh, in terms of territories, again, it, it depends on where you are in the country. And in general, it, for a territorial animal, it depends on the availability of prey, right? So if there's enough gophers and rabbits in a one mile square area to feed a bobcat, mile is plenty. And so like here in California for females probably, and females have smaller territories than males and males will sometimes overlap with a female's territory. Females won't overlap with other females and males generally won't mm. overlap with other males, but males and females sometimes overlap. And so one square mile in California would be pretty common for a female and a couple square miles for a male. But that can be five mile, five square miles as you move out of California. And then, you know, there are reports from like the Northeast that it can be as much as 40 square miles. Oh, and wow. some of that may also be with seasons shifting territories, right? So they're not covering 40 square miles in any given month necessarily, but over the course of a year to find food and water, again, depending right. on the conditions where they're living, 
So it, it really it boils down to where they can find food, water, and shelter, and, and how big an area they need to, to meet those needs. That is great. And this is just a question and a side, you know, for me too. So on my game camera, I get a little bobcat, actually, it shows up maybe once a week. So and mm-hmm. this has been happening for a couple of years. So I assume there must be a home nearby. She must have had babies or I'm not sure if it's a she it looks like a she, you know, you can kind of tell when she sits down and whatnot. But I say it's a she. But <laughs> But is that <laughs> well? I will tell you, if it's a male, you can usually tell as long as you get a clear view of the back end under okay. the tail. Is very obvi- if it's a male, that's very obvious. <laughs> okay, good to know. I'm pretty sure it's a she then. So, <laughs> but I think she's established uh, territory around here. So I, I would assume she's probably had kittens at some point, huh? I've never seen any kittens on the game camera. I was just curious about that. It, do they stay in the same territory year after year if they if it's good enough? You know, typically they yeah. will, unless there's a reason to move, um, you know, for animals, everything's about survival, right? So mm-hmm. getting the things they need to survive food and water and expending as little energy as possible to get those things to, con- to conserve that energy. So if they've got a spot and it's a good spot and they've got enough food and water and they don't have a competing animal coming in trying to push them out, then yeah, they would generally stay. Okay. And I don't, you know, in terms of if she's coming through once a week, then your your trail cam is definitely in her territory. So and yeah, that's kittens, exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kittens are harder to see generally. She might have them. Theoretically, females reach sexual maturity at one year, but a lot of them don't reproduce until their second year. Okay. And bobcats in the wild usually only live about seven years. So mm-hmm. there's not a lot of years of reproductive success for them. But but the kittens usually are in a very well hidden spot. So they, she doesn't bring them out, you know, very probably far from the den. Where and that's probably not in my view of the camera for sure. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, they will as the kittens get older. The first few months, the kittens really do stay in the den or very close to it. As the kittens get older, and this was part of what I talked about in my Bay Nature photo essay that you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm is all the things that a suburban bobcat mother has to teach the kittens to survive in a suburban or urban environment. And that's cars and crossing streets and people and dogs and and hunting. Hunting is a skill that a bobcat needs to learn no matter where it lives. But hunting in a suburban environment is a slightly different scenario. So, but near your trail cam, I'm sure if she had kittens, she would be bringing them out. Okay. She just may not be bringing them out right past the trail cam. Um, Okay. But eventually they have to, they will, first of all, they're, they're like our kids, right? It's like yeah. you tell them to stay put and they're all out of the den. Like, I mean, I'm out of I here. Had, I had night, night cameras and we had trail cams. <laughs> up. I had trail cams up on a den and I mean, it would be like 3 a.m. and all the kittens would be like trying to come out of the den and the mom would be like trying to get them all back in. And you could tell, I mean, she was like up all night with these kittens after, day after day. I look every night and the footage was more of the same. And I just kept thinking, Oh my gosh, like she's got to be ex- and then she'd go out all day and hunt to feed them. It was exhausting to even think about. Super moms. I mean, that's incredible. Totally. <laughs> I love it. Well, that brings me to your article. I loved your article in Bay Nature magazine. It was Country Cat City Cat and and you mentioned that just just now, but so you did. You you kind of follow this amazing bobcat mother who raises her her kittens and she had multiple litters right over the years in a suburban um, California neighborhood, I assume. And I mean, there's people, cars. And so that makes me think that they're pretty adaptable to humans, but is that true? Or is she just an amazing special mom bobcat that can raise her kittens in this environment? So how, how well do they adapt to us? Yeah. So she was an amazing, unique mom, I have to say. That said, bobcats are far more adaptable to living amongst people than I think people previously thought. Cats are so elusive generally that they're not seen. So people talk all the time about suburban and urban coyotes. And the truth is that in many places, there are bobcats too, but nobody ever sees them. Mm -hmm. They they tend to, and, and they're they're hard to study because of their temperaments and, and how sort of skittish and evasive and elusive they can be. But the people who have been able to study them, 
you know, they're sort of skulking the edges, right? If there's a riparian corridor, if there's a park, if there's a green belt that they can use to navigate from one little part of their territory to another, they're sliding right through the suburbs and people just don't know that they're there. They're just not as, not as visible. They are generally skittish and therefore not comfortable around cars, dogs, people. Right. So, so she was unique, but it, it is also true that bobcats, I think, are far more adaptable to suburban environments than people might have thought. That's amazing. Yeah, it's just amazing to think that some of these neighborhoods with a lot of homes have bobcats roaming around at night and, and coyotes, like you said, or even mountain lion for that matter in, in California here. Yeah, she seemed like a pretty amazing mom and you followed the, the lives of these kittens for a little while. How long were you with them? So I followed her for years. Each the the sets of kittens disperse. So then it's sort of hit or miss whether you see them again once they've reached about in her case close to about 9 or 10 months old, they would spread out. So, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to keep track very well recently of last year's kittens, which is what was in the Bay Nature story. You know, we're in a, an extreme drought right. and a lot of animals' behaviors and territories have shifted, I think, as a result. And so, and I haven't, I haven't been able to track them down recently to sort of see where they're at, but they also just could have moved on by several miles into a place that I haven't seen them. So... They're not in the immediate vicinity of where they were born, but that doesn't mean they're not five miles away and I just haven't seen them. Right, right. Well, that's amazing that they can adapt so well. And, you know, what What can we do as being neighbors with our wild animals and, and bobcats? Like, how can we be good neighbors? What can we do to help them survive in these areas? Yeah, that's a great question and topic that's close to my heart because I think we're so lucky to have these wild neighbors that I I sort of want everyone to try and do their part to make it easier for them to coexist with us. So I think, and you know, some things are more of an issue in some states than others. Certainly in California, we have a number of laws that protect bobcats from hunting and trapping. We also have rodenticide bans that are um, probably sort of at one end of the spectrum in terms of other states. But what I would say for bobcats is that um, rodenticide use is one of the biggest risks because the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides, some of which are used for gophers, um, what happens is even if a a bobcat eats a, a gopher that's been poisoned and doesn't immediately die from that poisoning, There have been studies on bobcats in California that have shown consistently that their immune systems become compromised. Mm -hmm. And so it both increases inflammation in the cat and it reduces their immune response. And so they then end up susceptible to and potentially dying from things like mange, which is a scabies that shouldn't kill them, but also other forms of parasites. And so, and enough of it will eventually kill them. So if they continue to consume a high level of, of poisoned rodents, they will themselves be poisoned by it. And that's a problem, not just for bobcats, but for all of our native predators that consume any of the prey that might be poisoned and raptors and owls and, you right. know, I mean, all those, all those species, <clears throat> excuse me, all those species have those issues. Right. The next thing I would say is actually an issue for bobcats, which is a little bit different than probably a lot of other animals, is that they're so darn cute. And bobcat kittens look a lot like a tabby kitten. And so many people mistakenly think that they are helping by feeding bobcats, and particularly by feeding bobcat kittens. And what happens, as you can imagine, is that it creates a couple of things. One, that bobcat may never properly learn fully to hunt and s- survive on its own. And two, and this is true of other predators as well, sometimes people feed coyotes and, and other foxes, other wild native predators. But once they view humans as a source of food, it dramatically increases the risks of conflict with humans and death from a car strike. So road strikes are another huge risk to wildlife living, especially in suburban areas, but even in rural areas. And when they are coming closer to humans to try and find food, they often will end up victims of being hit by cars. 
or they, we actually had a bobcat in Marin County have to get euthanized on a trailhead and it had been scratching at hikers and I guess nipped at a hiker's boot, which bobcats oh. are not aggressive towards humans. I mean, they do not, it, it's right. not a typical behavior at all. And it got taken into the local wildlife rescue and rehab facility. And ultimately the authorities decided they wanted to test it for rabies. And so it was euthanized. And when it was brought into the rehab, it was starving and covered in fleas and ticks and had internal parasites. And then Aww, it thing. turned out the neighbors said that, oh, when it was a kitten, they were feeding it at the trailhead. And they probably thought that they were helping or at least not doing any harm. But that bobcat actually ended up being euthanized as a result because it kept pursuing people at the trail trying to get more food because it couldn't feed itself. Instead so of hunting, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I always, Perfect. Project Coyote has a saying, you know, a fed fox is a dead fox. And that's true for all of our native predators, really. So if I could ha ask people to not ever use rodenticides, find a different way to control the rodents and actually native predators and owls are a great way to manage your rodent populations and to never feed, never feed wildlife, not for help. If, if, if people see an animal, even if it's a kitten or a coyote pup, and they think it's in distress or that it's been left and not going to be cared for, I always just say, please call your local wildlife rescue facility where somebody who's trained to assess that animal can see whether it needs help. And if it does, they can take it in. One thing that I think people don't realize is that bobcats, and I watched her do this when I was with this mom, mm -hmm. they'll leave their kittens for a whole day like the whole day. Right. If she's hunting and not killing and doesn't have something to bring back to them, they can be unattended by her for six hours, eight hours. It doesn't mean that she's abandoned them and isn't going to come back and feed them. But again, I think people sometimes very well intentioned see this tiny little kitten that looks like a tabby kitten sitting by itself. And they think, oh my gosh, it needs food. We're going to, you know, no nobody's coming to feed it. We better feed it. And yeah. it's just, it's, terrible thing to do for that cat. So if people could not do that, that would be great. And then, you know, the other, uh, the only other things I would say is that, you know, bobcats don't prey on domestic cats or dogs. They're not a food source for oh, them. Really? That's always the big fear, you know, or, you know, what you see on I social know. media. Yeah. 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 So they, they don't eat them. Okay. It is true that they can have altercations with them. And it's possible that in those altercations, those animals would, would be killed. But the reason they usually end up in those altercations is either a territorial dispute. So that pet has gone into the bobcat's territory and it's being territorial and protecting it, which is its instinct. Or it's a mother protecting kittens. And so I've seen a, you know, a bobcat go after or at least towards a dog that was just getting too close to a bush that had kittens under it. And right. the dog was curious and sniffing, but, you know, mom was protecting her kittens. And so if people keep their cats inside and their dogs on a leash and if they're in their yards, you know, to be outside in the yard with the dog, that can help minimize that kind of conflict and hmm. keeping pet food inside so that again, coyotes, bobcats, other native predators aren't coming by to the buffet to eat. You know, it's the same yeah. as not feeding them. Sort of don't accidentally feed them by leaving your pet food outside. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, because on the same trail camera, I have a black and white stray cat that follows the same path, like within minutes of the bobcat. And I'm like, wow, that cat is lucky, but the bobcat probably doesn't care about it that much. You know, interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. a question of whether it sees it as a threat. You know, again, yeah. animals expending energy, it, it has a price, right? So any mm -hmm. altercation, they run the risk of being injured or killed. So they have to, you know, it's it's a calculated. It's why some of the other animals, you know, they do almost the bluff charges or the sort of pretend fight where it's like more of just a like, I'm me bigger and meaner and somebody's going to stand down after they all puff their chests up a little bit and then <laughs> somebody backs away. Because right. they don't need, none of them, n neither animal in that scenario really wants to get hurt, right? So right. there's kind of, I mean, even when I've seen bobcats territorially fight, you know, it's usually a jump and like one quick smack of a front paw and then, you know, and then they separate. It's like yeah. over so fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like my two cats playing with each other. I've seen that before. <laughs> Quick smack to the head yeah. and the other, and then they run. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of funny. Interesting. Yeah. You know, and, and this brings me just one more question on the, on the food part. But, you know, you see a lot like, you know, I'm part of like next door and whatever. And you see a lot of 
post about people with the drought leaving water out for wildlife, you know, like, you know, bowls of water, you know, not just for the birds. Is that is that considered something that is threatening to a bobcat as well? They're probably, are they going to eventually find their own water source or, you know what I'm asking? Is that all right to leave water out or, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, that's, I had a feeling you were going to ask that question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting question. The truth is that I, so, and I think, again, people are well-intentioned, but yeah. you have to, the ramifications are beyond just the providing water. So for example, water, if it's not fresh water can stagnate and have things mm -hmm. in it that can make animals sick. And, you know, people know that about hummingbird feeders, for example, you can make hummingbirds sick with not cleaning out that sugar solution. Right. Um, other thing about it though, is that putting water in the yard can attract a variety of different species to the yard and actually create conflict as well as just like feeding wildlife, it brings them into human areas. So um, and so, yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, places like Project Coyote or like the wildlife rehab um, facility that's near me here in Northern California, they recommend against putting water out now. And I okay. understand, you know, we are in a pretty extreme drought. So I, I think that, you know, people worry about that, but it, it just, it creates the possibility of spreading diseases. And it also, again, creates the possibility that you'll end up with aggression between the animals that show up for water. Gotcha. And like I said, there's always the, the issue that they might become a nuisance in the neighborhood, you know, and, and so you have neighbors who maybe don't want, because when you think about all the animals, most suburban neighborhoods have skunks, raccoons, possums, foxes, coyotes, bobcats, and frankly, depending on where you are, there are mountain lions. You probably just haven't seen them. Right. And I'm sure I'm forgetting a few more squirrels, chipmunks, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you think about like, you're going to put out one big bowl of water in your backyard. Like if there are enough animals in the area, you kind of could create a bit of a situation. Gotcha. Yeah, I always wonder. I mean, I do have bird baths out for, but they're shallow, shallow dishes, and if they're dry at the end of the day, I don't leave water in there usually at night. So, but I'm really um, anal <laughs> retentive about cleaning them too. So, but, well, right. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. You know, if you're going to do it, it has to be fresh water every day, yeah. and you really have to use like a bleach solution to mm -hmm. wash it out like every week, because otherwise, what's in there, you can be actually making the animals sick. Yeah, that's good to know. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I was hoping, I know I wanted to talk a little bit to you about Project Coyote and the work you're doing with Project Coyote, because I've, I've talked to several people from Project Coyote, and I really appreciate the work that you guys are all doing. And you are the Youth Education and Outreach Coordinator, is that correct, with Project Coyote? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm really lucky. So I'm the program coordinator for Project Coyote has something called Keeping It Wild, and it's their youth education and outreach program. So yeah, I started out doing that a few years back as a wildlife educator, and I'm now the program coordinator for it. So yeah, what does that entail? What kind of work do you do with them? So for me, it's been a combination of helping create curriculum for classrooms for teachers to be able to use and tying it to the next generation science standards because, you know, teachers have so much material they have to cover in a given school year and wanting to give them information about native predators and compassionate coexistence, but making it useful to them in terms of hitting some of the marks they need to hit with their science curriculum. So Part of what I've done is help build PowerPoint presentations and other materials for teachers to use in classrooms. And then a second piece of it has been me doing presentations myself, which pre-COVID was in person mm -hmm. and post-COVID has been, or so, sort of during COVID, I guess, has yeah. been uh, webinars. <laughs> like we're still this not weird stage, yeah. Badly. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that was a cool thing on my part, but. <laughs> <laughs> I say post-COVID sometimes too, because I'm wishful yeah. thinking, I think, but yeah. So since that, you know, shift in all of our lives and how we've accomplished things, like everything else in my life, I did a lot of Zoom with Project Coyote as well as law practice and other things. So so I've done webinar and I've done classroom presentations, done a few 
podcast interviews, you know, with other programs about nature and wildlife. So really, you know, education, teaching kids about the value of native predators, of course, for me, passionate about bobcats, but all native predators, honestly, I, I really think are maligned and unappreciated. And certainly in many states outside of California are, are actively hunted and, you know, pursued in these wildlife killing contests yeah. where they're killed for money and prizes. And Project Coyote has a campaign to end wildlife killing contests. And, you know, state by state, we're making progress, which I is know. great. But that I was lucky in April, there was a high school, there's a high school in Chicago and we were contacted and they wanted to use wildlife killing contests as, to, to try and create a ban on them in the state of Illinois as Terrific. a day of service project to start working on that. And so I did a Zoom presentation for a group of high schoolers in Chicago, which was really fun. Oh, they exciting. were super enthusiastic and passionate. And I'm always inspired when I get a chance to interact with students about, you know, the value of predators and, you know, intact ecosystems. So it's really, it's a pleasure for me every time I get to do it in person or on Zoom. It's always fun. Yeah, how, yeah, it's encouraging. And I'm sure it's great to see uh, younger people, you know, get excited about this, this as well. And Chicago, you know, you think of a city, you know, what are they doing with wildlife? But the more I learn, there's, there's a lot of coyote coming back to Chicago and wildlife. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. So yeah. So what are your fa most favorite aspects of the work that you do now? Because I know you're you're also still a lawyer and working a lot and doing this as a passion and this has to keep you going somehow. So what keeps you going about this? Yeah, that's a great question. In a way, I think what keeps me going is what got me into it, which is the enthusiasm of the people that I share the images with and share the conservation stories with adults and particularly children. I, you know, to, to feel like, you know, p there's that saying that people, we protect what we love. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge believer that photographs and video convey something to people and reach them on an emotional level that a written article doesn't without those images that go with it. And so I feel incredibly lucky to be able to interact with people with these images and videos and share them and and see that spark of interest and, and passion about these animals light, especially with kids, because they are obviously the future of this planet. And so they're going to inherit whatever we have here and what we do. Sorry. So Yeah. <laughs> you know. Hopefully we're and not leaving a bad. Maybe some of the prior generations haven't done the best job. <laughs> I know. We're trying. We're There's trying. There's a lot of yeah. for growth in this whole world. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I think. I mean, so for me, it's 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 twofold. I have obviously a tremendous amount of personal gratification and sense of sort of, I don't know if, if peace is exactly the right word, but I always say there's nothing that calms me more than sitting at the beach by the ocean or sitting in a field with a bobcat. Like those are the two things that I get grounded so quickly that way, no matter what else is spinning in my head. And I, I have a grade A monkey mind when I get spinning, you know, I can, the, the stress can type A, you know, can get going. And so, yeah, so there's that personal aspect of it for me, just of of being able to be present with wildlife is just a gift for me in my life, whether I was able to publish articles or not or, or do presentations. But then the second thing I think that I find so gratifying and I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to do is to share that experience and share that passion and hopefully spark that level of interest and passion in the people that I'm sharing the stories with. And, you know, there are things that, it just takes a small group of people committed to changing something to make changes happen in a state or in a community. And there are individual choices that we all make that impact whether we manage to coexist successfully with these wild neighbors or we don't. And right. if I can influence one community, one group of kids, like it's an incredible gift. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very hopeful. And I assume that that's what gives you the most hope. I usually ask that more specifically, but I think I think that does give you hope. That's great. So how can people find you and maybe read some of your articles and see some of your photographs? Where can they go? Yeah, so there's a couple different places people can go. I have a website, which is 
my name. So www.sarahkillingsworth.com. And I have a variety of different galleries of different species. And then one of the tabs um, at the bottom, there's an image of a bobcat that's uh, publications. And if people click on that, you can then get a list of my recent publications, webinars that have been recorded, and also podcast interviews that have been recorded. So that's a good way for people to sort of see a lot of different things that I've done in the last couple of years. And then I'm also on Instagram at SK, my two initials, wildlife photos. So I, I try and post twice a week to Instagram. As you know, when you're trying to do too many things already, it's one more thing to do. But I really, I do love sharing the photos and it is, it's a really fun platform for photographers. So I, I try and keep up with posting pretty regularly there. So yeah. And then I'm on Facebook. People can follow me there. I okay. admit that I post less regularly there, um, but I'm there. <laughs> yeah. I know. I think with photography, it's uh, Instagram is a good platform for that, for sure. I'll post these yeah. links on the show notes as well for, for our listeners. So, but yeah, yeah. Um, I think those are all the, the questions. I, I do have more questions, but I know you have to get on with your day. <laughs> but what, you know, do you have any advice or any other things that you may want to say of maybe people wanting to learn more about bobcats in general or wildlife coexisting with wildlife in general? Yeah. So I think if people are interested in coexistence and particularly coexistence with native predators, Project Coyote's website, which is, you know, projectcoyote.org is a great resource. They have a lot of programs too for ranching with wildlife to help people coexist who are in um, the ranching or agricultural fields. They also have a coyote friendly communities program to help people more sort of in suburban or urban areas who have coyotes in their neighborhoods. And a lot of the things that I've touched on, but they have programs, they have signs and, you know, things that they can do with the neighbors. And then raptors are the solution. R-A-T-S is another great place to learn about rodenticides and the impact of rodenticides on ecosystems, not just the target prey, but all the other things that are impacted by it. Mm -hmm. um, if people are, are inspired or interested in the concept of sitting and being truly present with wildlife, I really highly recommend the book, What the Robin Knows. <laughs> it's a really great sort of a how-to and an essay about a, a person's personal journey and very informative. I mean, a lot of really good knowledge there too about bird behavior and actually how bird behavior can help you know when predators are coming. So for example, I know that if I hear a scrub jay calling, it often means that there's a bobcat or a fox in the neighborhood. Yeah, Something too. is approaching, right? So, so that's a great, a great resource that's for people true. to read. And then I think if people are interested in, in photography and in wildlife photography, I mean, I think it takes a really, a strong combination of curiosity and determination and definitely patience, but uh, people, I think, sometimes look at, there are amazing photos out there, of course, and amazing animals in Africa and Antarctica and all these exotic places, but the truth is there's wildlife everywhere, mm -hmm. and you don't need to be in a national park or a foreign country to get really wonderful photos of wildlife. And during the pandemic, you know, Audubon had some photos from backyard birding, you know, mm -hmm. people were posting from their yards. But, you know, any park, any green space is going to have wildlife, and it's going to have more than, I mean, birds for sure, but mm -hmm. probably more than that, and especially in the evenings or early mornings, you know, people, you might find skunks and raccoons. And on the one hand, maybe they seem common, but I have to tell you, they're babies. Like when you get a parade of baby skunks behind a mom, it's pretty stinking, stinking cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. So I would just encourage people to, you know, if it's something they're interested in, to to take advantage of whatever is nearby, whatever opportunities. And in a lot of urban and suburban areas, there's far more uh, wildlife than people think there is. And so next door can actually sort of be a useful site for that because people will post about wildlife and mm -hmm. and then you can get a sense of maybe which neighborhoods certain animals are hanging out in. But, but yeah, to, to try and follow that passion and that creative outlet, even if it's not a full-time not a full-time gig or not paying your rent necessarily, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And your dedication to that as well. So, 
Well, thank you for all you do, Sarah. I really appreciate your time and talking with me today and and a lot of good points, I think, of coexisting with wildlife and bobcats. And yeah, so I hope people enjoy the show and listen. And thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure getting to talk with you today. Well, this concludes our episode 99. Wow, phew, we made it. And this is just a huge milestone for me, as I said before, because I am such a shy introvert. But I am Marcia Civic, and this is Be Provided Conservation Radio. I have a little bonus here, and this is a little added clip recorded at the Wildcat Education and Conservation Fund, where they have been caring for a bobcat ambassador that was raised in captivity and cannot be released to the wild. They use Dakota, the bobcat, as an educational ambassador to teach young and old about bobcats and why we need to keep them in the wild. It is a coincidence, or it isn't a coincidence, that Dakota in the Sioux language means everyone's friend. In this clip, we hear Steve Flaherty and Josanne Vereen discuss why bobcats have short tails. Listen closely and you will hear Dakota purr and a little trill. Enjoy. Yep. So, and a little white cat on the tail. So why does a bobcat have a short black. tail? These are good questions. Why do the bobcats and cats have these short tails and some have because long their, tails? Their they don't need technique them. doesn't require a long counterbalancing So tail. that would be a hindrance to them. Correct. Okay. So the kinds of things that he preys on. And he does all the small rodents. Rodents, little birds, lizards. Mm-hmm. Hi, baby. And these guys You're a local baby. Rough Please check out our show notes to see a picture of Sarah and one of her bobcat photographs. Her photography and articles can be found at www.sarahkillingsworth.com and Sarah is with an H. And you can also check her out on Project Coyote at projectcoyote.org. And Sarah also posts regular photos on Instagram at SK Wildlife Photos. So today's music is licensed from soundstripe.com. The song is The Wild by Elsevier Lake. And stay tuned. Like I mentioned, our 100th episode is coming soon. And I'm excited that I was able to celebrate this in Traverse City, Michigan. And I, I made new friends. Uh, Caitlin was wonderful. And North Sky Raptors are wonderful. And we are very excited. So stay tuned, everyone. And we'll learn about some amazing raptors in northern Michigan. Have a great day. Stay safe and stay healthy.